Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's great to be back with you once again. Please open up your Bibles to Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, please. Matthew chapter 6. And we'll go from verse 19. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Now this, of course, is taken from the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And what Jesus is challenging here is kind of, you know, a, a very materialistic society. And this is, of course, is taking place in Jesus' home region of Galilee. And this is what the people would have been like at this time. Very materialistic, very worldly. And this part, this section here from the Sermon on the Mount is kind of challenging that materialistic idea. Which begins in uh, chapter 6, verse 19. So it's Matthew chapter 6 from verse 19, if everybody's there. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what he's saying there is, is that everything that you have here on earth, your possessions, your wealth, you know, your goods, it's all things which can be here today and gone tomorrow. You know, you can have a... Millionaires who have millions in the bank, and but what happens when the banks crash, which we've seen before, and it is going to come again? That money can be gone overnight. Thieves can break in and steal it, as it says, where moth and rust destroys. Everything that we have in this life is temporary. You came into the world with nothing, and you're going to leave with nothing. Everything that we have, you can't take it with you when you leave this earth. So what he's saying is, is to store up treasures in heaven. How do we do that? Let's see. Verse 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So basically we need to be careful what we're exposing our eyes to, don't we? We need to be careful what we're allowing into our minds through our eyes, of course. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, mammon is a term which is used to describe wealth or materials. And what it is, when you have idols in your life, when you have things that you, that you worship and things that you love, these things actually have demons behind them. These are demons that are behind these things. When people have a certain love for something, there is an evil spirit behind that. And of course, the love of money and the love of wealth, there is an evil spirit behind that. And the embodiment of that, Jesus refers to as mammon, the love of money and the love of wealth. Again, all these idols, they all have names behind them. Now, it's appropriate actually that we've just partaking in the Lord's Supper this morning, because in 1 Corinthians 10, there's a kind of a, a parallel passage that warns against that, about serving two masters. You know, you can't serve two masters because you'll either love one or hate the other, or you'll either be loyal to one and despise the other. Well, in the language and terminology of communion that we've just taken, it says in 1 Corinthians 10, in verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. So we've just come to the Lord's table right now this morning. But unfortunately there are way too many out there who want to come to both tables. They want to come to the Lord's table. And then as soon as Sunday is over they want to go back to the table of demons. They want to worship the things of this world. They want to have idols in their life which are not of God. That is taking part in the table of demons. That is drinking the cup of demons, which Paul says right here in 1 Corinthians 10, you simply can't do both. You can either eat at the Lord's table or you can eat at the table of demons. You can drink of the Lord's cup or you can drink of the cup of demons. You cannot serve two masters. That is what Jesus is ultimately getting at here. Verse 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? 
Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So these lilies, they don't have to work, they don't have to toil or spin. And yet Jesus is saying here that God has made the lilies more beautiful than Solomon. When he was arrayed in all the gold garments and things like this, Solomon was the richest man on the planet at the time. And even the lilies were not arrayed like him, it says. Verse 30. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. He's saying the Gentiles, obviously the non-believers, the pagans, they're the ones who worship the material things of this world. They're the ones who worship idols. He's saying don't be like them. So we likewise are told to not be like the unbelievers, unbelievers who have idols in their life. We're told to not be like that. Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. So all the things that he just described there, all the things that we need, seek first the kingdom of God and then all these things will be added to you. So there's an order that is given there, isn't there? It's not the other way around. It's seek first the kingdom of God and then these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So again, it's seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So it's not just the kingdom of God. It's seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then these things will be added to you. In other words, we are to live a righteous life, just as Jesus commanded us to do. Now, the attitude that Jesus is addressing here, this materialistic attitude, is kind of the same problem that we see in the book of Haggai. The book of Haggai is a two-chapter book towards the end of your Old Testament. I just want to say as well how much I I despise this term minor prophets because it's not a biblical term, it's a term that man has invented. And when people say about the minor prophets, well, does that make you want to read the minor prophets? It doesn't, does it? It doesn't sound very appealing. Oh, it's only minor. It's not minor in its importance, it's minor in its length. You know, these prophets, some of them books are only one chapter, some are three chapters, they're very short. But it's most certainly not minor in its importance. Every book in the Bible is there for a reason, by the Holy Spirit. It certainly is just important as every other area of our Bible. So the term minor prophets is a very misleading term. Now, in the time of Haggai... You need to kind of understand the book of Ezra as well, because what's going on in the book of Ezra is kind of the background to what's taking place in the book of Haggai. When the Jews were exiled into Babylon for 70 years because of their sin, Jeremiah warned about this. Jeremiah warned about the sin of the people, which became very, very depraved. They was into like idolatry and child sacrifice and things like this. And as a punishment, God sent the Babylonian army against Jerusalem and they wiped Jerusalem to the ground and they exiled the Jews into Babylon for 70 years as a punishment for their sin. Well of course in the book of Ezra we see that after the 70 years are complete the king Cyrus sends them back to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple. That's the background of what's going on there. They send the Jews back to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple. So under Zerubbabel and Jeshua and all the other leaders, they return to Jerusalem. They find that there's many foreigners who have come to the land of Israel during the time they was in exile. And they begin rebuilding their temple. But after a certain amount of time, they begin getting opposition against this building. The foreigners who have come to the land of Israel are now opposing the rebuilding of the temple. So the rebuilding actually stops. And we see actually there is a 20-year hiatus where nothing was going on. For 20 years, the building of the temple ceased. And during that time, the people obviously lost interest in building building the temple. And they began focusing on their own lives and their own interests. They began building their own houses and establishing their own families and things like this. So not things that are wrong, not at all. They're simply losing interest in the work of the Lord and prioritising their own lives over it. 
And that's what kind of makes the book of Haggai a little bit different to the rest of the prophets because the books of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah and, and Micah and things like this, they're dealing with the sin of the people. All the prophets were called to rebuke the nation of Israel for their sin. Haggai isn't necessarily dealing with sinful things. He's dealing with wrong priorities. So the purpose of the book of Haggai was to get the Jews back working again on the things of God, on the temple, because they've become so invested in their own lives, they've become so invested in their own interests, that they completely lost interest in the work of the Lord. Hence why the temple, the rebuilding of the temple was on hiatus for a 20-year period. And that is why God sent the prophet Haggai to the Jews to tell them, basically, to get their priorities right. We see, for example, in Haggai chapter 1 in verse 4, God says through Haggai, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your panelled houses whilst this temple lies in ruins? Again, they're all building their luxury homes whilst the house of God still lies in ruins. So that is why God sent the prophet Haggai to get the Jews back working again on the things of God rather than in their own interests. So, of course, the Jews do listen to Haggai, and they do listen to the word that's been given, and they begin rebuilding again, despite the opposition that they received 20 years prior. And it's at that point where God says in Haggai chapter 2, verse 19, from this day I will bless you, because they chose to obey, they chose to put their priorities right, and they began building the temple again. And God says, from this day I will bless you. Because before this, the people were really struggling. Again, we see in Haggai chapter 1 that there were tough times. There were food shortages, things like this. The people were really struggling. Even though they were investing in their own lives and their own interests, the people were really struggling because of food shortages and things like this. And again, it's no different today, isn't it? Look at today. Look at the cost of living, how it is now. Well, it's the same sort of thing at this time. But the reason for that is because God was withholding those blessings. Why? Because... They had their priorities wrong. They were all about their own lives and their own interests. They weren't interested in rebuilding the house of God. Hence why God was withholding those blessings. What did Jesus say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then these things will be added to you. So all those blessings that the people were missing out on because of their wrong priorities, those blessings eventually came from that day that they said, we're going to obey the voice of the Lord, we're going to obey the the voice of Haggai, And we're going to get our priorities straight. So that is exactly why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and then these things will be added to you. So they got their priorities right. They began rebuilding the temple. And that's where God says, from this day, I will bless you. Same sort of problem that we see Jesus contending with in Matthew 6. And unfortunately, it is very much the same today where there's too many Christians who are interested in their own lives over the things of God. Christians today are very busy with work and families and their own interests, their own finances, things like this, when they haven't got time for investing in the things of God. Now, of course, I'm not saying every Christian is like that. There's many Christians who do sacrifice their time, their finances for the Lord. But unfortunately, it's a big problem in the church where Christians are interested more in their own families and their own personal interests over the things of the Lord. And that is something that the Bible contends with in the book of Haggai and, of course, right here in Matthew chapter 6 as well. When you're interested more in your own finances and your own affairs over the things of God, this is when God withholds blessings. He did it in the time of Haggai, and I believe he's doing it right now. The reason so many people are struggling is because they're not interested in God. They're not interested in the things of God. All they're interested in are their own lives, their own interests, their own finances. And again, what did Jesus say? Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal. But sow up for yourselves treasures in heaven where no one can steal them and moth and rust cannot destroy them. That's what Jesus is getting at. We see a kind of parallel passage to this in Colossians. I believe I read this passage last time I was here with you. Colossians chapter 3 In verse 1, it says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, those things are in heaven, those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So we are not to set our minds on the things of the earth. Why? Because the things of the earth are temporary. 
they're going to be gone one day. When you read about what it says about the last days and how the world is going to end, these things that we have in this life are going to, are going to burn. They're going to be destroyed. But the things that we invest in in heaven, when we set our minds on the things of heaven, the things of God, those things can never be destroyed. And that's why Jesus is telling us, not just the people in Matthew 6, but he's telling us as well the same thing, that we are to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. We are to make investments in heaven. You can make investments here on earth, of course. And again, there's nothing sinful about that. There's nothing wrong in building your finances or raising a family or building a luxury home. There's nothing sinful about that. But what Haggai and Jesus are both getting at here is wrong priorities. Our priorities need to be the things of God over the things of the earth, as it says right here in Colossians 3. So the life we should be investing in is not this life, but the life to come. Again, this life is temporary. This life is going to end one day. We are here today, gone tomorrow, aren't we? Just like it says in Matthew 6 about the grass. The grass is here today, but then tomorrow it's thrown into the oven. Well, that's like us, isn't it? We're here today and gone tomorrow. So we are not to invest in this life. We are to invest in the life to come because the life to come is not here today, gone tomorrow. The life to come is eternal. If you're born again, of course. That's only for those who know Christ as their Lord and Saviour. The life to come, the life that it describes here in Colossians, your life is hidden with Christ in God. That life is not temporary. That life is eternal. And that's the life that we should be investing in. Now, of course, as I said, the reason God withholds blessings is because of these wrong priorities. And I believe that's happening right now because everything is going up in price. The cost of living is getting out of control. People are struggling. It's exactly what was taking place at the time of Haggai. We'd be pleased to know that there's one thing that hasn't gone up in price, and that's salvation. It's still free. Hallelujah. It hasn't gone up in price, neither will it. It is still free. Salvation remains a free gift. Salvation is free. Serving the Lord is not free. Serving the Lord involves cost. It involves sacrifice. It involves self-denial. And again, this is the sort of thing Haggai was contending with. He was contending with people not willing to put the work of the Lord first above their own interests. But it's what we're commanded to do. We are commanded to put the work of the Lord above our own work and above our own lives. We are commanded to make sacrifices. Again, do not confuse serving the Lord and salvation. Salvation is a free gift which we receive by faith. Serving the Lord... And following the Lord is not free. That involves sacrifice, that involves cost. Jesus spoke about this in Luke 14, in verse 27, where he says, Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost? So if you're going to build a tower, you will count the cost. What it's going to cost you to build this tower? Why? Because you might not be able to finish it. Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. What happens when someone wants to follow Jesus but has not counted the cost and they fall away? What happens then? People mock them, don't they? People laugh at them. People think they're ridiculous. Verse 30, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king does not sit down first to consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Again, a king going to war will count the cost. It's no different to today. If this nation is going to go to war, our leaders will sit down and think, can we, can we afford this? Can, can we afford to go to war? That's what Jesus is saying here in Luke 14. Verse 32. Or else while there is another great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions for peace. Again, he's talking about a king being humiliated because he couldn't fulfill what he set out to do. Likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he, can, that he has cannot be my disciple. Again, he's talking about following Christ. Because it says in Matthew 16 in verse 24, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So again... It's not just talking about believing in Christ, it's talking about following Christ, isn't it? We are commanded to be followers of Christ, and that is actually what the word Christian means. The word Christian, in Greek, is Christianos, and it means a follower of Christ. 
So we are told to believe in Christ, of course, and we are also told to follow Christ. And following Christ involves, as it says in Matthew 16, 24, it involves self-denial. It means putting Jesus above everything in our lives, including our own families and our own finances. It involves bearing our cross. We are all told to pick up our cross and follow Christ. In other words, we sacrifice our own things for the Lord. We are supposed to make sacrifices for the Lord. Again, salvation is free. Following the Lord and serving the Lord is not free. It involves cost and sacrifice and self-denial. So again, we are not just told to believe, we are told to also follow. Following Christ involves cost. It involves putting things above your own interests, which again, naturally, we don't want to do, do we? We want to be invested in our own finances, our own families. It's against our natural human instinct to go, to go against this, isn't it? But we are told to do it. It's a commandment. We are told to put Jesus above everything in our lives. And again, he says, if you don't do this, you cannot be my disciple. It's his words. And again, that is when those blessings will come. There is rewards for putting God first in everything you do. Whether it's your finances, whether it's your family, whatever it is. Whether it's serving the Lord. Again, you know, people serve in this church. People serve in many churches. They do it at cost. You know, you could be sitting at home with your family now on a Sunday morning, you know, watching TV. But no, you're here serving the Lord instead. It's come at a cost, isn't it? You've had to sacrifice something in order to serve the Lord. And that is what we are always commanded to do, is to serve the Lord, but it comes at cost. We are always told to sacrifice whatever it is that is stopping us from serving the Lord. Again, do not confuse salvation and service, or salvation and rewards. Again, there are rewards which come... As a result of this, rewards in this life, but also rewards in the kingdom of God as well. Because however well you fulfill your calling in this life, I believe I spoke about this, about the parable of the talents uh, some years ago here. However well we fulfill the calling in this life determines your life to come, what that's going to look like. If you have fulfilled your calling in this life, if you have made those sacrifices and denied yourself in order to serve the Lord, then the life to come you're going to have a pretty special role in the kingdom of God. Again, the parable of the meaners in Luke 19 relates to this as well. It all determines what your next life is going to look like. So you can sit at home doing nothing in this life, and then in the life to come, there'll be nothing for you. The rewards in the life to come are determined by what you do in this life. But of course, there are rewards in this life too. The blessings, the very blessings that God was withholding from the people at the time of Haggai, those blessings can come simply when you deny yourself, make those sacrifices and put God first in everything you do. That is when God says, again, according to Haggai chapter 2, from this day I will bless you. If you're not seeing God's blessings in your life, is it because you're not putting him first? Again, do not confuse salvation with this, but are you putting God first in everything you do? Are you even putting God above your own family and your own finances? I'm not necessarily talking about the tithing route here because, of course, we're told to honour God with our wealth and we're told to you know, be a generous giver, as it says in 2 Corinthians. God loves a cheerful giver. But I'm talking more along the service lines. Again, we are told to give financially, but we are also told to give in service, in making sacrifices for the Lord with our time and our service as well. So we are told to serve the Lord. Now, of course, that's going to look different for every person. Every person has a different calling upon their life. Every person has different giftings and different talents. That's what the parable of the talents is all about. In the parable of the talents, it doesn't mean talent as in gift. It means talent as in a weight of gold. It's just a coincidence that it happens to be the same word talent that we use. But we are told to use our talents, our gifts and our abilities for the Lord's glory. So if you're not using those, God may have gifted you with something that he wants to use. And if you're not using those, that's when God can and will withhold those blessings in your life. It's not until you make those sacrifices, just like they did at the time of Haggai. They chose to obey the Lord and to put off their own interests in order to focus on the rebuilding of the temple. And that's when God said, from this day, I will bless you. So maybe it's a self-sacrifice And a self-denial that's required in your life in order for God to say to you, from this day I will bless you. 
It's always when we're putting the things of the world above the things of God that we're not seeing the blessings come in our lives. Again, many Christians want to drink at both cups. Many Christians want to eat at both tables. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, you can't do both. You have to either serve God or serve the devil. Jesus said you cannot serve God or mammon. You cannot love money and God at the same time because you'll love one and despise the other. Again, it's the love of money which is the root of all evil, isn't it? But again, I'm not talking simply about the money side. I'm talking about serving the Lord with your gifts and abilities and making those sacrifices and denying yourself in order to serve him. Because when you do that, that is when God will say, from this day, I will bless you. What did Jesus say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then these things will be added to you. It's not the other way around. It's seek first the kingdom of God, then these things will be added unto you. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us have a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you uh, for this day. We thank you for this gathering, and we thank you that today we've been able to come to your table to partake in the body and blood of your dear son which was shed for us and we thank you for the blood of christ which cleanses us from all sin we thank you that our salvation lord is a free gift from you a free gift which we don't deserve we thank you lord that you did not spare your only son to rescue us from the judgment and to bring us into eternal life but lord we know that you never saved us with the intention of us just sitting at home doing nothing We know, Lord, that you saved us with the intention of working for you and building your kingdom. And Lord, help us now to examine ourselves and to know what it is you want us to do for your glory. Whatever giftings or abilities you have given us, Lord, we pray that they will be put to good use for your kingdom. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will just enable us and give us boldness to step out and to serve you in whatever capacity that may look like. We pray, Lord, that you just give us the motivation and the encouragement, just like when you sent the prophet Haggai to the people to begin rebuilding the temple again. We pray, Lord, that if the work of the Lord is not being done in our lives, that you will just motivate us and encourage us and give us boldness to not, just, to not just love you, but to serve you as well, Lord. For our love for you to be demonstrated through our service for you, Lord. And through our service to each other. Help us to put you first, Lord, in everything we do. And Lord, you know that we all have interests here on earth. We have, we have families, we have jobs, we have houses, we have finances here on earth, Lord. And we know that those are gifts from you, Lord. And we thank you for those. But Lord, help us to have the right priorities. Help us to not make the same mistake that people made at the time of Haggai, to have wrong priorities. But help us, Lord, to put things in the right order in our lives and that you may come first in everything we do. Help us to honour you with our wealth and our finances. Help us also, Lord, to honour you with our service. Help us to make those sacrifices. Help us to deny ourselves in order to put you first in your kingdom, to rebuild your house. And we thank you, Lord, that we get to serve you. Thank you that that is a privilege, Lord. May it never be a burden to anybody to serve the Lord. May it always be with a cheerful heart and never begrudgingly that we serve you, Lord. Help us to always have the right attitude. Help us to get those things in the right order, just as your dear son Jesus commanded us. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then these things will be added unto you. Help us, Lord, to prioritise the order of things in our lives, Lord. But above all, Lord, we do thank you for the free gift of salvation which you've given us through your dear son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you, brothers and sisters.